Welcome to r slash reddit revenge. This is a story of someone getting back at someone with revenge, after being wronged. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel, and for so many likes. The first story, a woman cut off my mom, damaged her car, and had her cop boyfriend try to cover it up. The second story, I won't pay you for your work, better think twice before I ruin your show. And the first story is, woman damages my mom's car and blames my mom. Her corrupt cop boyfriend covers it up and ruins both of their reputations. For some background, I live in a predominantly white suburban town in New Jersey, and my family is Asian. Although the town is alright for the most part, it's not really a secret that some of the townspeople are pretty racist. One of our neighbors, let's call him Anthony, is a retired police captain from another town, but he's friends with my town's police chief. My mother is a first-generation immigrant, and although she's fluent in English, she still has a pretty thick Asian accent. A couple of years ago, my mom went to visit one of her friends on the other side of town. My mom had parallel parked directly in front of her friend's house, which is at the bottom of a small hill. As she was leaving, a woman driving a Jeep Wrangler with her children was driving down the small hill, but she was still a decent distance back, so my mom pulled out of her spot. The road they were on was really wide, with enough space to fit five cars next to one another and about 40 feet ahead was a stop sign. My mom at this point was already in the middle of the road fully out of the parking spot and had gotten about 10 feet when the woman driving the Jeep suddenly came up from behind my mom's car and cut directly in front of her, crossing a double yellow line to do so. Because of the angle she cut off my mom at, the Jeep's rear wheel ended up ripping off my mom's front bumper. My mom naturally immediately stopped and the woman got out of her car after straightening it out on the road. As soon as she stepped out of her car, this woman immediately starts cursing my mom out at the top of her lungs. Karen told my mom to call the police, but my mom told her that her phone had died. My mom's friend and her son as well as the neighbor came out of the house after hearing the commotion to see what had happened. The neighbor, an elderly man, asked what happened and Karen yelled, Are you effing blind? An effing accident happened. Go call the police. I need to call my boyfriend. The son had taken a law class in college, so he offered to take a bunch of pictures of the scene of the accident and send them to my mom later. This becomes super important later. The neighbor calls the police, but Karen's boyfriend arrives at the scene first. When the cop, let's call him Kenny, finally arrives, he asks my mom what happened. Just as my mom had just started saying her side of the story, the cop says, wait just a minute, and walks over to the boyfriend. As it turns out, the boyfriend was a cop in the town who was pretty popular with the kids in the middle schools, since he would occasionally visit to talk about things like D.A.R.E. and other things in assemblies. Sam was off duty at the time, so he was able to come over when Karen called him. As soon as Kenny saw his bud Sam, he immediately went to go talk with him, rather than with my mom or with Karen. They discussed for a little while, and afterwards sent everyone on their way. My mom tried to talk to Kenny before he left, but Kenny just brushed it off and said he got the details he needed, and that the my mom would be able to get the police report in about a week or two. When my mom receives the police report, she saw that it said that she pulled out without using her blinkers suddenly and hit Karen's car. On top of that, Karen was expecting for my mom's insurance to pay for the damage done to her rear wheel. My mom went to my neighbor Anthony to ask what she should do about the report, since it was clearly wrong. Anthony was furious and told her that she should go to the police station and ask to see the chief, and if they ask why she needs to see him, she should tell them it's because she wants to file an internal complaint. That day, my mom takes the photograph sent to her by the son and goes to the police station and asks the person working the front desk to see the chief. The cop says that she could not just walk in and ask for the chief, so my mom responds, okay, so where should I go to file an internal complaint? And the cop immediately straightens up and says, right here, come with me. He leads her into the back. The deputy chief steps into the room and started recording the conversation. Since the chief was out, my mom presented all the evidence to him instead. After presenting the evidence to show that it was in fact Karen that hit her, instead of the other way around, my mom also says that she'd like to file a corruption complaint against both Kenny and Sam. Kenny clearly did not do his job properly, since he did not properly ask the actual people involved in the accident, and did not even note the fact that there were two passengers in Karen's car in the report. Even Karen later admitted to an investigator that Kenny never once spoke to her. My mom even threw in the racist card for good measure, saying maybe Kenny wouldn't listen to her and he brushed her off because of her thick Asian accent. Meanwhile, my mom also filed a claim to her insurance and prevented the evidence to them too, and her insurance decides since the accident, in their eyes, was clearly not her fault, they weren't going to pay Karen a penny, that they would contact Karen's insurance to pay my mom instead. A lot of internal bureaucratic investigational BS happens, including interviews with Karen, my mom's friend, and the friend's neighbor. About a month passed, and an officer comes to our house to tell my mom that Kenny had been punished. 
but there was not enough evidence to punish Sam, and he wanted to know if there were any other concerns she had. Since Karen seemingly had not done anything to further warrant any action, and the damage to the car was paid for, my mom said that there was nothing else. This is the fun part. Three days after the officer came to our door, a letter came in the mail for a court hearing. Turns out Karen decided to file three tickets about my mom, just one day before the statute of limitations. Apparently in New Jersey, citizens are allowed to file complaints about other citizens breaking the law, a thing that our family had never heard of before or until this happened. And because of how late she filed these complaints, by the time we received them in the mail, we could not even counter complain, and the only options were to pay the fine or go to court. We assume that Karen learned about being able to file a complaint from Sam, because no SH, and that the only reason she was willing to go this far was because she heard my mom had a super thick Asian accent and assumed that my mom wouldn't know what to do about the tickets and would just pay up. What she didn't count on was the fact that my mom is actually really aggressive, with an absolutely massive network of people that she knows. Within a day, my mom hired a lawyer to fight the case, and they immediately asked to change the court from the small court in our town to one of the large courts a couple of towns away. The logic was that if she fought the case in our town, my mom would be at a disadvantage, since her case was essentially going against our town's beloved police force, but by putting it in a different town, the playing field would be even. Additionally, while my mom worked from home in her own business, Karen had a full-time job in town, so going to court in a different town would be a huge pain in the A for her. The lawyer had prepared a huge amount of evidence against Karen, so there was no way she was actually going to win the case no matter what. Come the court date, Karen never showed up, so the case was thrown out. That was a pretty nice win, but what came after was even better. Since my mother and sister have a lot of friends in town, the story of Karen and Sam doing this shady bullcrap got out really fast. Soon half the town had heard about it, and suddenly Karen and Sam went from two favorites in the town, because of Sam's reputation, to two of the most underhanded and nasty people. Sam stopped getting invited to school assemblies, and Karen was ostracized in her kid's school's PTA. Anthony also ended up talking to the police chief in private, and we found out that although Sam was not officially punished, he was severely reprimanded by the chief. The next story is, my revenge on promoter who thought paying me was optional. In the music industry, certainly the production side of things, we've all done SH gigs. The sort of gigs that you know from the moment you get booked that it's not going to be fun. Being female in this industry, this sometimes works in my favor, sometimes not. So I get a call from a promoter who wants to put on a show locally, and I got recommended to supply all the sound. I run a small PA rental company. I ask him the usual questions. What's the load in and out time? What's the technical specs of the band? What's your budget, etc., etc.? We agree a fee after 30 minutes of telephone negotiating. We're both happy with this fee. It was 1,500 pounds, which is very reasonable for the personnel and equipment being provided. The only thing I always insist on when I'm working for somebody I don't know and have never worked with before is that I require cleared funds upon arrival at event location, a phrase that I rattle off many times a year, and I never have any issues. Me or my crew will bring 50,000 pounds worth of gear to your event, We'll sometimes even start setting it up, but as soon as possible you need to pay us. So this promoter showed us where to load into this theater slash concert hall type venue. While my guys were walking around the venue checking the usual things, like mains, outlets, PA flying points, etc., I took the promoter to one side and produced my printed invoice and said my usual spiel. Me, I know you're real busy, we need to start setting up, so if you can sort payment now then I don't need to bother you again. He did the whole guilty looking at his shoes thing. Promoter. Um, I don't have all your money right now. I'm waiting for my business partner. He has your money. He has it all. Can you wait for him to arrive? Me. Okay, it's not a problem. What time's he due to arrive? Promoter. Around an hour or two before the door is open. He has to set up the bar, so he won't be later than this. Me. Look, I've not worked with you, but in the spirit of future business relations, I'll take payment in full any time before the start of the show. Promoter. Thanks. He has the money. It won't be a problem. Me. Haha, <laughs> I know. If I don't have the money before the start of the show, then I'm not turning the PA on. Said jokingly, but with a stern face. So my guys set up everything. We work efficiently for the next few hours. The band arrive and we all get on well together. They're friends of the promoter and don't seem as bothered about the money as we do. I mentioned that this was the first show with this promoter and the drummer, who is the informal leader of the band, said the promoter has a different sound company every time they gig. This gives me and the two crew guys cause to look at each other uneasily. We finish sound check and as the band head to their dressing room, we sit around stage left watching the audience spilling in. Showtime is T-1 hour. I see the promoter hanging around stage right, so I pop over to see him. Me. Hey promoter, everything okay so far? Happy with everything? Promoter. Yes, very happy. Everything's perfect. Band say sound check went well. Looking forward to the show. Me. That's good. Let's get payment out of the way and I can leave you alone to enjoy the show. Promoter. Uh, listen. Ticket sales have been slow for this show. Can I pay you afterwards? 
Me? I thought you'd sold 1,200. At 20 pounds a head minimum, that makes at least 24,000 pounds you should have more than enough to pay. I'm being kind but very firm. I'm sorry, but you need to sort out payment before the show. We've trucked 50,000 pounds worth of this gear here. We've even set it all up and so far you've had all this for free. Sorry, but I can't do the show without payment up front. Once we've done a few shows together and we've built up a trust, then I can help you out. But this is our first show, and I have rules, sorry. Promoter. Okay, let me see what I can do. T-10 minus minutes to showtime. My team is ready to go, but we're anxious by now about the dodgy promoter. The band are with us stage left and ready to go on stage. They know the situation. They know we've not been paid yet, but they don't seem that bothered. They're friends with the promoter and seem to side with him. I'm almost thinking about starting the show and getting the money afterwards, but I stop myself. Don't break your rule, I tell myself. Showtime, T-1 minute. The promoter comes over to stage left and tells the band to go on stage. He'll intro them on. My team are all in position behind the mixing desks, etc., ready to go on my say-so. I tug the promoter's shirt by his elbow and look quizzically at him. Where's the payment, I ask? Promoter, yeah, yeah, smiling. Let's get the band on stage, and I'll nip and get it for you while they're on. Me, but, as promoter walks onto stage, whoa, I call after him, almost shouting. I'm furious. I know that it's impossible to kill the audio mid-show, and that Riot may well break out if I did this. Much easier to not put myself in this position to start with. I glance over at the front of house engineer, who's looking at me for guidance. I did the classic flat hand drawn across the throat signal for kill it. Both my audio guys hit the global mutes on their desks, and the promoter walks over to the center of the stage and speaks into a microphone, but nothing, and I mean nothing, comes out. Utter effing silence. The crowd boos. They cheer, then they boo again. The promoter looks over at me angrily side stage. I gesture to him rubbing my fingers together, in the other internationally recognized gesture of pay me my effing money. Things are about to get heated, so I grab a mic we have set up side stage, but out of sight of the audience. We call them voice of god mics or emergency mics. Ladies and gentlemen, sorry but due to a foreseeable hitch, this show will be delayed by 5 minutes. Cue audience chanting and lots of tension building up. A lot of sweat dripping from the promoter instantly for fear of his reputation. No word of a lie, I had full payment in cash in my hand within 3 minutes. The show went ahead, and I went on to do several other shows with this promoter. He never tried to screw me again. Thank you for watching. Have a good one.